Hi, everybody. My name is Hanan Weissman. I'm the White House Liaison to the American Jewish Community. Um, and uh, before we even continue, let's just give one more round of applause for the film. So everybody has a story. Um, every individual in this room is here because somebody in their family made the journey to this country. I'm here in part because my paternal great-grandparents boarded a ship from Galicia at the turn of the last century to search for a new opportunity, free from the perils of their reality at the time, free from the perils of their surroundings. Years later, when my paternal grandfather was fighting off the shores of Normandy, my wife's grandfather was fighting to maintain his own humanity in the concentration camps in Auschwitz. My wife Ilana is now tucking our three kids to bed right now because her grandfather survived and found refuge here in the United States, building a new home, creating a new family, starting a new life. And so let me pause um, and ask the following. If you are in this room today, in the White House, because Martha and Wade Still Sharp saved your life, or your parents' life, or your grandparents' life, or someone in your life, can you please do us the honor and either stand up or raise your hand? And if you are in this room today because you are a descendant of Martha and Wade Still Sharp, can you please do us the honor and either stand up or raise your hand? In this room today, our scholars and students, Holocaust survivors and grandchildren of Holocaust survivors, former refugees and advocates for refugees, diplomats and film directors. Which brings us to the next part of today's event, the moderated panel discussion. We have two directors and two leading US government officials here today to help us unpack what we just saw and what it means moving forward. When I call your name, please do us the honor and join us on stage. Ken Burns needs no introduction. His name, his name is synonymous with award-winning documentary filmmaking, having brought to life almost as many films as years I've been alive, including such classics as The Roosevelt's, Jackie Robinson, and The Civil War, among many, many, many others. Please join me again in welcoming Ken Burns. <laughs> Artemis Joukowsky, or Joukowsky is not only the co-director of Defying the Nazis, he's also the grandson of the Sharps and the author of the recently released accompanying book. Ladies and gentlemen, Artemis Joukowsky. Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken is a public servant's public servant. His stewardship of the State Department, along with Secretary Kerry, and leadership on a range of foreign policy issues, including the global refugee crisis, continues to inspire many to a career of public service. Ladies and gentlemen, Deputy Secretary Tony Blinken. Deputy National Security, Security Advisor Avril Haines will be here, and if she isn't already, um, so she might come in a little bit, but I'm gonna introduce her regardless. She serves as the White House lead on the refugee issue and is the first woman to not only serve in her current capacity, but also in her previous capacity as the Deputy Director of the CIA. And serving as our esteemed moderator of today's discussion is Michael Abramowitz, Director of the Levine Institute for Holocaust Education at the U.S. Holocaust Museum. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike. And with that, I hand over the mic to Mike.
Thank you, Hanan. What a thrill to be here at the White House. Uh, first of all, thank you to Hanan and the White House for organizing this wonderful event. Uh, thank you especially to Artemis and Ken for your beautiful movie, which gives us uh, timeless, a timeless message of the importance of individuals standing up uh, for persecuted people anywhere in the world. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd also uh, like to recognize a couple of my colleagues from the from the Holocaust Museum, uh, but in addition to being the director of education for the Holocaust Museum, I used to run our genocide prevention program. Not many of you know, but the Holocaust Museum, in addition to a mission of trying to look at the past, we also try to do our bit to uh, prevent future genocides. And uh, uh, my colleague Cameron Hudson is here, and also Sarah Bloomfield, the director of the museum. So thank you for all the work that you do. The story that we just watched a little snippet of is uh, a story with great relevance to the world today and the world in which we live in. And this is what we're going to talk about for the next 45 minutes. Uh, from our founding 25 years ago, the museum has been intensely interested in the story of uh, immigration. Uh, while the Nazis were the perpetrators of the Holocaust, we want to remind our visitors that this was also an American story and that decisions in Washington and attitudes in America had an impact on the fate of the Jews. And this subject will be the focus of our next special exhibition on the American response to the rise of Nazism, a major focus of which will be, which will be the refugee crisis of the 1930s and 40s. As Hanan said, we are currently in the midst of the greatest global displacement crisis since World War II. Some 65 million people displaced, a third of whom have crossed borders as refugees. And it is important to st state at the outset that while there are parallels to the 1930s and the current crisis, there are also differences, not least of which is that unlike during the Holocaust, and perhaps because of the Holocaust, governments have instituted elaborate and comprehensive structures for protecting refugees. And while it is clearly an imperfect system, these kinds of structures did not exist back then for Jews and others fleeing Nazism. America perceived of its responsibility in the world differently than it does today. And the result, as we will lay out in our exhibition, is that many of the victims of Nazi Germany who might have been saved were not. And the Sharp story is wonderfully inspiring, but we all need to recognize that the Sharps were the exception, not the rule. And so I'd like to start the conversation with Artemis and Ken, first with Artemis, which is, why did you want to tell the story of Waitzel and Martha Sharp, your grandparents, and how did you come to make your film? Well. It really began in the most extraordinary way. I was given an assignment by my ninth grade history teacher to go and interview someone of moral courage. And I came home and I asked my mom, who should I interview? And she said, well, talk to your grandmother. She did some cool things during World War II. <laughs> and little did I know, a whole new world would open up to me. And that started a quest in my life to not just understand why they did what they did, but could we, could we do this again? Could we teach altruism? Could we teach the kind of courage that they had to do what they did? And so my, my quest in this film is to try to answer that question. Ken, a number of your projects have been about very big subjects like World War II or the Vietnam War. What uh, this seems like a smaller tale in some ways, but what attracted you to, to working with your friend Artemis on it? First of all, my friend Artemis, uh, who I've known for many, many years, and he'd asked me to, to sort of informally advise him on a project that he had been working on, as you can tell, from age 14, and was a great passion, and I thought I had the luxury of giving uh, expert, in quotes, advice uh, from long distance when he called every six months or so. Um, three years ago, he sent me a rough cut, and it was very rough, but there was something that animates my interest in all of the subjects you mentioned, whether they're big or small, which is it was a good story. It was a hell of a good story, and I didn't know anything about it. And while this is the first project in my life where the filming is done, the archives have been assembled, there was a great need for some organization, for some structure, for some good old-fashioned storytelling uh, to find the voice of Tom, to get Tom Hanks to read the voice of Wade Still Sharp and, and a few other things that suddenly plunged me deep into this project. And so I gravitated from being 
of an advisor to an executive producer to a co-producer uh, to a co-director. This is, in every sense of the word, Artemis's film, and I'm happy to be an amanuensis and to try to help make it happen. And I, I think we're all, in some ways, challenged as your introductory remarks, as Jerry's introductory remarks suggested, by this almost existential question, what would we do? Uh, Clement Brown speaks about it at the end, the great conversation between Feuchtwanger and Waitstill about why he's doing it. These, this is what keeps us going, as it, none, of, none of us are getting out of this alive, and we could reasonably be expected to be curled up in a fetal position, but we don't. We create governments, we run those governments, we are filmmakers, uh, we raise families, we survive, we do things. And so to me, I was drawn inexorably into this utterly American story, and yet one that we're unfamiliar with. It's an American story. I mean, these are five Americans, oh, oh, two of five Americans, who are listed among the righteous among the nations. 25,000 non-Jews are listed at Yad Vashem. And fi only five are Americans, and two are Waitstill and Martha Sharp. And it begins to raise, I think, beyond the film, huge questions about what our role has been, what we could be doing now. And so, uh, you know, I have to tell you, as filmmakers, it's really wonderful to have, after the film is done, a conversation like this. But when you're working on it, it's really single-minded. And David Blistein is here, who helped uh, work on this film as well. Um, it's all about trying to tell a good story. You don't, you know, I mean, the, the, the Sharps are Christians, He's, he and she are saving Jews. There is the Old Testament in common. In Ecclesiastes, there's the phrase, what has been will be again, what has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. And as filmmakers working in history, you understand that that simply means that human nature remains the same in wonderful ways and clearly in horrible, evil ways. And while we worked on the film to try to struggle to tell this story well, we were never unmindful that its rhyming, its, its echoes could be found in our present moment. And we hope that the film, as much as being a riveting story, we hope, uh, is also one that, that makes each individual ask that question, would I have done that? Clement, you know, Martha says, oh, anyone would have done it. He, Clement Brown is right. Not everyone would have done it. And so the, it, come, it falls back on us now. What will we do? Let me ask a question of Artemis before we turn to our policymakers, which is that one of the really incredible facts that's you know, in the short snippet of the film that you showed was that 17 people before your grandparents uh, turned down the offer from the Unitarians to, to undertake this dangerous mission. What do you think motivated your grandparents to make such a fateful choice? Did you ever have a chance to talk to them? What did, what did, what did, what did your grandmother tell you? Well, when I got to know them, and I knew them separately because they had remarried other people and they were no longer a couple, um, they spoke with the same intensity then at 80 years old that they felt uh, when they were doing this work. And it was a deep sense of indignity that the Germans and the Nazis were were, 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 were objecting the world to, and they wanted to fight that. My grandfather uh, declares war from Germany from the pulpit. Imagine a Unitarian declaring war from the pulpit. I mean, it's a remarkable kind of uh, arrogance almost from his own standpoint, but for him, he was outraged, and he had to take a stand. You know, for Ken, let me just ask Ken one quick question. That's fascinating, and the point is that so you know many Americans were obviously at the time the country was deeply isolationist. There was a lot of fear of foreign entanglements. People didn't want to go back to another war. I mean, that's really kind of incredible uh, that a person like that. Can you put it in a larger context of uh, this period? Well, you know, it's it's interesting that parallel, as you know, parallel to this has been an interest on our part to to make a film that explores the larger, more aerial view that this, we hope, very specific and and relatively small story uh, tells from the bottom up, a top down view of the United States in the Holocaust. And we, you know, we're we're aware of the famous story of the St. Louis stopping at Santiago, Cuba, and being turned away, they'd already taken in too many Jews and turned down in Miami or in Florida because the quotas had been exceeded and we had an exceedingly uh, anti-Semitic State Department that didn't permit the Roosevelt administration, which was 
for the most part, interested in helping. And we need to get to the bottom of this. And I think this film is one story that, for me, um, has one other element which is about potentiality. Even though this is a tiny story, there is a kind of opacity now to, this, to the phrase six million. We don't know what it means. You do an extraordinary job at your uh, home there of, of helping remove that stigma. Uh, but what happens, what comes through in the people who are sitting here today and the two dozen that are in the film, is you begin to understand the extraordinary potentiality that is permitted to play out in these lives that are saved. And for me, working in, in this relatively small pond of the story of the Sharps permits you to think that every single one of those six million had a potentiality as great or greater than the people that are in this room today and their professor emerita of mathematics and French and Russian and uh, just an amazing set of accomplishments from a random set of people who were saved. And then that makes you ask, again, not just the existential question, what would I do, but what would have happened? What were those lives? They are the amputated limb that we still feel and why our film is dedicated to those who did not get rescued. So, so let me turn to our, our policymakers. First of all, Tony, uh, in some ways, uh, you bridge the gap between the, between the past and present. Your, your, late your late stepfather was a Holocaust survivor and refugee himself, and you've spoken out a lot on the refugee crisis, including at our museum. Uh, what lessons do you draw from this film and how it can be applied to the present? Well, first I really want to thank um, Artemis and Ken and everyone behind this film because one of the lessons you draw from it is exactly what we heard from Artemis and Ken, which is that if you're not able to humanize a problem, it becomes an abstraction. And we in the policy world are debating and discussing every day the policy ramifications of how to deal with what is truly a global uh, refugee crisis and migration crisis. And we try to grapple with the different issues that come into play, our security, our humanity, our obligations uh, in being responsible. But unless it's humanized, you lose sight of what it's really about. And that's why this is so important and so powerful. Um, we're all the product uh, of our own stories and backgrounds. And in my case, uh, my grandfather uh, fled what uh, was then uh, Russia, fleeing pogroms, came here, and America welcomed him with open arms. And he was able to have a, a family, send three kids to Ivy League schools, contribute. And this is where what Ken was just talking about, the potentiality, is so important. Contribute in important ways to the United States. My stepmother fled communists in Hungary in the dead of night on a train, wound up in the United States because America opened its arms to her. And finally, my stepfather, um, my late stepfather, Mike, uh, Mike alluded to a moment ago, he came from a town uh, that some of you may well know, Bialystok in Poland. Uh, he was the only survivor of 900 children in his school and the only survivor of his family. At the very end of the war, after having been uh, in Dachau, Majdanek, Auschwitz, the very end of the war, um, he and a number of other uh, concentration camp prisoners made a break for it during a forced march, basically a death march out of the, the camps. Wound up in a Bavarian forest and uh, hid out, and they somehow uh, escaped uh, their, their captors. And after a couple of days, he heard this great rumbling. And he looked out from where he was hiding, and what he saw was a large tank but instead of the dreaded swastika, it had a five-pointed white star. And he ran to the tank, and the hatch opened, and a large African-American GI looked down at him, and he didn't speak English except for three words that his mother had taught him. And he got down on his knees, and he spoke those three words, God bless America. And he was lifted into the tank, into freedom, into the United States, because that's who we are. That's what we are, if our better angels carry the day. So what we're trying to do uh, is to somehow translate those better angels into our policy, even as we're responsible for security uh, and many other um, uh, obligations. And it's a constant struggle. And again, I finish with 
coming back to Artemis and Kenneth, thank you, because this is exactly what inspires us every day, the real story. And the Sharps are the better angels of America. Thank you, Tony. One of the points that we really uh, make at the museum is that the American response to the refugee crisis 75 years ago was heavily shaped by domestic considerations. Fear of foreigners, fear of immigrants, fear that these, these, these immigrants might take our jobs in the midst of the Great Depression. And so, you know, you find that even while Americans were sympathetic to the plight of, of, of Jews, um, a decisive majority, right up to the outbreak of World War II, did not want to lift the restrictive immigration quotas that were, uh, that were uh, uh, preventing uh, more Jews to come to safety, that, that, so that they wouldn't have to come uh, the way that the, uh, the Sharps had to help people. Today, how much does public opinion help or hurt you with what you at the White House want to do on the refugee crisis, and what can you do to change that? Sure, I'll start. I, um, let me just say also thank you. And, uh, and the way you framed it at the beginning, can I just say the idea that can you teach altruism is really one of the most remarkable ways of, of thinking about it. I, I find that um, this is, for us working on national security, uh, you tend to spend a lot of time on the dark side of life. <laughs> and, um, and it is, uh, you know, and there's so many tragedies and threats and issues to be addressed. And this is an area where, in so many respects, what you see people come to the table, they are so very excited to actually work on something that can benefit other human beings and enrich our societies in the way that you've described and do something that is, uh, you know, at least from our perspective, really um, a remarkable blessing for the future in the way in which we approach ourselves. And I also, I mean, my grandmother uh, was escaping the pogroms and came and come to America. And as Tony said, I think we are all a product of our backgrounds, but it also just teaches us so many different lessons and ways to think about the people that we're talking about. And when we try to approach the broader question that you're describing, I mean, I, I'd say there's a couple things. I, one is, look, you, you know, as a human being, you do look at the situation and you see the tragedy and you see uh, the, um, the need to reach out and, uh, and part of what makes our country great in so many respects is that we do want to reach out and we do, you know, there is a remarkable generosity and one of the things that I've really loved um, doing in this space is opening up letters that the president gets from people from across the country, and many of them are not at all reflective of the political debate that you see on a day-to-day -day basis about this issue, but instead are people from, you know, a guy who is a farmer in the Midwest who says, Ten, you know, send me 10 Syrians, I've got room, you know, this sort of thing. And it, there are people in this country, and it gets lost a bit, who have this remarkable generosity and who want to be seen as the leaders that we can be in these areas and, and do the right thing in so many respects. But part of what we also try to do, I think, in, in our discussions on policy is talk about, frankly, the policy impact of the migrant crisis and the national security impact of the migrant crisis. And beyond the altruism and the goodwill and the fact that it enriches our society, all of which are good reasons to do this, there's actually a very compelling national security argument for why it is that it's important for us to do this. And you know, you talk about the 65 million migrants, about a third of which have crossed borders, and we think of you know, potential uh, refugees in that circumstance. And it, uh, all of our analysis tells us that this is not a problem that's going away that in fact the trend is such that we'll continue to see an increase in the migrant crisis. We know that uh, also the analysis is that over half of them are under the age of 18. These are really remarkably vulnerable populations in different areas. And there are a lot of factors that are leading to the concerns that are at issue. But we know that if the migrant crisis continues as it is right now, 
We're seeing how it destabilizes countries, that it leads to increased national security problems for us because of that. When you look at things like you know, Lebanon, which has a population of about 4.5 million, right, accepting about a million refugees, and you realize what that must do to that society and the strain it puts on that government in that circumstance in an area of the world that has a lot of problems already. Uh, you know, and you compare that, for example, to the million that Europe has had to absorb and how much, frankly, that has affected them with a population of roughly 500 million in that area. So it, that's a major issue that has to be addressed. And unless we figure out a way to address this issue, we're not going to be able to address some of the national security impact that's coming towards us that will cost us much more over the future if we don't solve this problem. So that's one issue. Another is the transnational criminal networks that feed off of this. So we've seen, I think Europol estimated about three to six billion dollars in what it is that they're seeing for uh, the amount of money that is going to the trafficking system that essentially allows for smuggling networks that's then feeding other kinds of criminal networks around the world, so we see that. We also see the advantage that, frankly, a refugee program can solve for us, which is to say we bring into this country people who are able to basically uh, demonstrate by their very presence here that we are not at war against Islam, as many of the counterterrorism, many of the terrorist groups that are out there that we're fighting indicate. And moreover, they help us to understand better how to fight those you know, basically the, the sort of violent extremism that we see coming into our societies from those messaging areas. So there's all kinds of ways in which we try to ex uh, essentially educate people on why it is that this is in our best interest from a national security perspective, from a foreign policy perspective, from a, a values perspective, from all of these different ways. And it helps us also then to explain why it is that people should take risk. And I think you know the, the, the issue of the fear that people feel and that they talk about in the context of this, you know, I, 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 this is an area where um, I think it's important not to be too dismissive, right? To sort of, to say, look, we recognize that you're concerned about terrorism. We recognize that these are issues that are of uh, concern to you. We want to tell you all of the different ways in which we're trying to address that and why it is that the refugee program can be done in a way that is still respectful of that and you know, is still uh, minimizing, essentially, the risk that you are concerned about in terms of bringing in terrorist elements from other countries, but nevertheless allows us to do what we do best. So I think that's sort of the way that we think about it. Thank you. We're going to, in a minute or two, uh, open it up for some questions from the audience. But I just wanted to follow up, Averill, and either you or Tony, I think you made a really interesting point about the national security uh, case for uh, dealing with the refugee crisis. But in some ways, it's an even more imperative national security case to kind of deal in some ways with the root causes of, 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 of the problems that spawn the refugee crisis. So, you know, obviously one of the things we talk about a lot at the museum is the issue of prevention. Can you just touch briefly about the kind of efforts you're making to try to prevent these crises from, uh, from, from beginning in the first place? Because that was a problem in the 30s. We didn't actually deal with the root causes of the, re of the refugee crisis, and I fear sometimes that's what's happening today as well. Um, let me say a word about how we're, we're trying to address the, the present crisis, and then maybe you want to turn to talk about some of the preventive measures um, that, that we're looking at. One thing that's really important to remember is we're very focused, uh, rightly, on the problem coming from Syria and Iraq. That's what's dominating the news. But it's really important not to lose sight of the fact that this is a global challenge and global problem. And there are refugee-generating crises basically on every continent. And if you look even at Europe, yes, many coming uh, from Syria, but also Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and of course North, North Africa. Uh, we have here uh, in our own country so many young children uh, trying to come from Central America. We have almost a dozen countries in Africa that in one fashion or another are experiencing some kind of uh, pressure that is resulting in people leaving their homes and putting their lives in jeopardy to try to go somewhere else. So we have to keep sight of the global problem. But just quickly on Syria, the way we're thinking about that in terms of getting a grip on it is in terms of um, concentric circles and the innermost circle, Syria itself. And of course the answer to stopping what's happening is to stop the civil war um, and to stop the pressure that is forcing people to take this extraordinary chance uh, and leave everything behind. And uh, the President, Secretary Kerry, others are working basically eight days a week to do that. 
Uh, and meanwhile, as we get things like, hopefully, a cessation of hostilities that holds, or the provision of humanitarian assistance that actually reaches more people, that takes a driver away. Uh, and that makes it a little bit um, less uh, acute. Then there are the countries surrounding Syria. The countries of first refuge for uh, refugees. Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan. As Avril mentioned, Lebanon, extraordinary. Somewhere around a quarter to a third of the population is a Syrian refugee. There are more Syrians in public school in Lebanon than there are Lebanese. If you equate that to the United States, um, the number of people they've taken in, it's as if we had taken in 60 or 70 million Syrians over the last five or six years. And you know the debates we're having about 10,000. But there, what's driving people, what's pushing them to go even further, to put themselves in the hands of traffickers, to put their lives in jeopardy on the high seas, is not the violence anymore, thank God. That driver is gone. But it is uh, the ability to get their children in school and to be able to work. And so we have to try, and we're working on this, to enable these countries to provide greater access to education, greater access to employment, so that people can have a life. I remember sitting with um, refugees in, um, this was in Beirut, and at uh, Caritas, which does extraordinary work, this is Catholic Charities, helping them. And you would go uh, from the room with the men, uh, to the women, to the children. And the men were almost uniformly depressed because their dignity had been stripped away. These were people who had been productive members of their society, their community in Syria, who couldn't work, couldn't provide for their families, and they felt it, and you could feel it. The women were almost frantic with their energy, but it was all about their kids. How are we gonna get our kids in school? How are we gonna keep them in school? And the children, thankfully, still had that innate optimism uh, that comes from being uh, a child, and we can't lose them. Finally, we have this larger concentric circle uh, and that's the entire international system that's designed to deal with this. And there, it's grossly underfunded. We're working on that. Um, countries need to do more on resettlement, including the United States, uh, and we're working on that. Um, and we have to take a system that was basically developed out of World War II and adapt it to um, this, uh, unfortunately, this modern era where this crisis is going to be with us for years and years and years. I think the average length of time, once someone is, um, a refugee, um, that they're away from their place of origin, if they do wind up going back now, is somewhere between 15 and 20 years. So you're not going to fix this uh, overnight. So we're trying to approach it um, in that way. But then there's the whole preventive aspect. I don't know if you want to say a, a word about that. Sure. I, yeah, I, I think maybe three points to add on, because I think Tony's really given you the larger scheme of things. I, I think one issue we're facing is that we've got Sorry, thank you. One, one issue that we're facing is that we've got a short-term and a long-term problem, and we've got to be managing both at the same time. And, uh, and one of the things I've learned I through this process is that, much like we are, a lot of countries have a humanitarian assistance budget. And uh, when it comes to trying to fund uh, people who are arriving in your country, right, you take from your humanitarian budget and you use that to basically deal with resettlement issues, other things that are associated with the cost of having people arriving on the border of your country for asylum cases or other things, and also for your refugee program. At the same time, as Tony mentioned, we're trying to create a certain amount of resilience and uh, drive kind of systemic and an institutional change in our humanitarian infrastructure so that we're capable of managing uh, when people arrive on your border, right? So we, we provide a lot of assistance to countries of first asylum in order to try to help them manage the people that are arriving, such as Jordan, such as Lebanon, such as Turkey, variety of places where we see countries of first asylum. If you are spending all of your money on people who are arriving and sort of the short-term piece, what you are taking away from is your long-term development assistance funds. And as a consequence, part of what we're trying to do is through, for example, the Refugee Summit that the President is hosting at uh, UNGA this year on September 20th, is we are trying to push a number of countries to increase or start refugee resettlement programs so that we can actually 
kind of broaden the burden around the world for this issue because with 65 million, even with us increasing our refugee resettlement program, we're only up to 85,000. The president has said at least 100,000 for next year, but that's obviously a drop in the bucket compared to all of the folks that need to be dealt with, right? So we need more countries to take more people in and we have the largest refugee resettlement program in the world, so that really does tell you something. And, uh, and we need more countries to start being refugee resettlement countries, right? So that's one piece. But in addition, what we're doing is we're asking countries to increase significantly their contributions to humanitarian assistance that the UN is doing, for which they have an absolutely enormous shortfall, basically only a third, roughly, of what they think is necessary to deal with humanitarian crises around the world and much of the long-term development assistance that we're talking about has been filled. So we're asking countries to fit into that piece and that's a part of it. But I think, you know, in terms of the drivers and the preventive piece, the only thing I just add is people think of conflicts as being a piece of it and that's obviously one reason for why it is that people are driven to leave their areas persecution, a variety of other types of things that people normally think of in refugees, but a place where we're seeing a, a significant increase and we expect it to increase over the next 10 years is climate change, environmental factors leading to refugees. And that's a critical issue that we need to spend more and more time on. And obviously the Secretary of State and the President have spent an enormous amount of time on this issue, but that's another place where uh, we have to think through how it is that we can help to you know, address those types of challenges. And then another one is economic. And it's very interesting in our studies what the intelligence has told us is that when you look at the data, it's not simply about um, countries where they're having trouble from an economic perspective and therefore less people are getting more. It's where you see an enormous disparity between the poor and the wealthy that actually drives it. So it, there are a lot of factors that we're looking at that we need to be focused in on for the long term as part of this process. Okay, I think we have time for a couple of questions. I'm gonna suggest that I collect three questions from the audience and uh, for either the filmmakers or for the policymakers. And, uh, and uh, I think that's what we have time for. Anyone? Uh, yes, ma'am, in the front row and then, and then back there. We all have our own opinions about what we'd like to do to change this, but none of them really work. Within the last maybe 20 years, a church in our community took in a Laotian family and got them resettled and on their feet again. The temple in our community took in a Russian family of Jews who were refugees. If every house of worship in the United States took one family, just a family, one family, why doesn't somebody bring that out? This is something that could solve a lot of it. Uh, then back there, question. Oh, I haven't forgotten you. You can give it to him and then, that's okay. Oh, sorry. This is, <laughs> this lady, sorry. Um, so with the yesterday having been 9-11 and with the increasing amount globally of attacks of terror and on a basis of both personal and systemic violence. How is it that we can keep our society focused on the roots of these problems, whether that be gun control, Islamophobia, imbalance of power, as opposed to falling into the trap of just feeling fear or buying into this idea that everyone else is our enemy and we need to protect ourselves instead of reaching out and discussing what's going on. This is obviously a, a, an, a question for the policy people. I just want to add this, the little tiny drop of story to begin this. We had an opportunity to screen portions of this film in Los Angeles and two women uh, came up to me in their 90s, survivors of the Holocaust, and said that they'd very much enjoyed the film but then said, is this going to happen to us again? And it made me so angry uh, about that. There, there's the one story to animate what are complicated policy directions and obviously political movements, but the notion that two Jews surviving the Holocaust could come to the United States, could live out their lives in prosperity and, and, and peace, 
could at the end of their life even remotely feel that this could happen to them again is stunning and shamed me to my core that I did not have an adequate way to say, to guarantee their safety. Tony or Avril, do you want to ask, answer the question either about the suggestion from, about the churches uh, and places of worship or also this question about fear? Um, I think it's a wonderful idea. And what we're already seeing is uh, the faith community playing a leading role in being part of the response to this crisis. And what's actually wonderful is um, having been to um, one of the resettlement centers um, in Oakland uh, a few months ago. It was an extraordinary collection because we had, um, we had a church, we had a synagogue, we had a mosque, we had the relief agency that was doing the resettlement, and you had um, a synagogue taking in uh, and then uh, trying to help resettle uh, a, a Muslim family. You had these three faith institutions working together. It was extraordinary, but I love your idea of trying to encourage literally every place of worship to, uh, to do something. That's, that's a great idea, so we'll, we'll follow up on that. But I, just to, to come to the fear question, and it really, I think, to me at least circles back to where we started. Um, we have lots of, I think, compelling policy arguments about, and Avril laid them out beautifully, about why it is in our interest, including in our national security interest, to engage this problem, to be open to it, uh, and to continue to open our arms. And we will continue to make those arguments, and we have to carry the, uh, carry the day on them. But I still fundamentally believe that uh, unless we can tell the stories, unless we can humanize this, we don't really reach people. And then you get lost in the back and forth uh, of Washington, particularly in a presidential um, election season. That's why, again, this film uh, is so important. We need to tell the stories. Um, in Jordan, uh, I was sitting about a year ago with some young Syrian refugees who were in their late teens. And um, this was at a center that was run by, um, by UNICEF, not doing extraordinary work. And we sort of got to talking about their, their futures. And these are kids who had been totally uprooted, didn't have any obvious means of going back home to Syria anytime soon, were living in very challenging conditions. But they all had a vision. They all actually had an idea of what they wanted to do. And one young woman wanted to be a doctor, another wanted to be in, in fashion, young men wanted to be in, in, in business. And we were talking back and forth, and we suddenly started talking about computers. And I was curious how many had access to computers, since it's so much the lifeblood uh, of our world now. And interestingly, most of them in one way or another did, some at the center, others because their families, despite their circumstances, had uh, a smartphone, at least one in the family. And um, I had my uh, phone with me, and it's uh, an iPhone, and I held it up and said, how many of you know what this is? And oh, you know, they all knew what it was. And I asked, do you know who, who makes this? And a couple of them said, oh, yeah, sure, Apple. And then I said, do you know who, who founded Apple, who started this company that makes this phone that so many people know? And then one of them said, oh, yeah, uh, Steve Jobs. And then I said, do you know where Steve Jobs' father came from? Silence, and one of them said, Syria. <laughs> so every single one of those kids, and it goes to what Ken was saying, could be the next Steve Jobs to our tremendous benefit. Right. Our job is to just give them a chance. I think we have time for one more question. And I had a, there was a question back there. The, the, uh, can, we, can we take one more here? We'll take one more. This, this lady right here. So why don't you ask your question, and then and then you and you can ask the question, and then we'll wrap it up. Um, what could your average college student do to help assist you guys in this process? So one of the most exciting things about this film is we're doing interfaith screenings on many college campuses, working with Hillel House and Newman Centers, really to bring the faith communities together of colleges to have this conversation and, as Tony said, to humanize the conversation. Um, the way we talked about it initially, about your life and your life and, and how our lives are connected to the story is what we have to do for all of us. and to fundamentally understand that every American comes from some immigrant story, for some connection. So we are all connected in that immigrant story somehow, forced or not forced. Somehow we came from other places and we need to embrace the courage it took 
to make the life that we have in America. So that's what I would love to see, is to show this film and have these interfaith conversations instead of focusing on where we disagree from faith standpoints, to look at this, the similarities and the context. You know, to save one life, we save humanity. That is said in the Quran, that is said in the Talmud, and that's said in the Bible. You know, that's what we have to teach on college campuses. And I think college students want that. This lady here had a question as, as her final question. Hi, Latifa Woodhouse. Uh, thank you, Artemis, for saying that. I appreciate your extraordinary work, both Ken Burns and Artemis. And I'm proud to be in America and proud to be a Unitarian, proud to be a daughter of refugees. And Tony, I could relate to your stories. I know, you know, where I came from and how my parents made it in this country. And this is the country that gives a chance to all human beings that have come from different walks of life through all kinds of uh, situation. The, my question is, and I'm giving you a message from a group of Syrian refugees that I was just there in August um, at a camp uh, called um, Kerasso. They told me, please tell President Obama what have we done wrong? Why can't we have a normal life? Why are the bombs still dropping? And my heart breaks for these women and children who have lost their fathers, who have lost their brothers, and they are in a situation where the heat is 120 Fahrenheit, and there is very little food and very little help provided by the United Nation. They have lines for hundreds of people to get a little cup of soup and a little piece of bread. So I'm bringing that message to the policymaker of the United States of America, and I thank both of you for this work, and we need more education and more work as such to enlighten this wonderful country. Americans are willing, and they will do the good work, just like this wonderful lady mentioned. We gotta start from faith community, from schools, from colleges. It is possible. Canada has done a lot better than us. We gotta do better. Okay, I think we are done, and Hanan will wrap it up. Yes. Well, thank you, everybody. I think there's a concept in Judaism, when there is no man, strive to be that man. When there is no person who's stepping up, strive to be that person who steps up. I think it's fair to say that the Sharp family definitely stepped up um, many decades ago. And so thank you to Ken and to Artemis for bringing that story to life. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you also to um, our panelist, Deputy Secretary of State Tony Blinken. Thank you, Deputy National Security Advisor Avril Haines. Thank you, Michael Bromwitz, for moderating this panel discussion. Thank you to all of you uh, for showing up today. One brief uh, logistical note. I understand that there is a group of individuals who will be going to the Holocaust Museum, and the bus will leave in about 10 minutes. Um, priority seating will be given to the Sharp rescuees and the Sharp Tchaikovsky family. The bus will be parked just outside the security gates across from 17th Street. Um, I think, Mike, you're going to be yeah. leading the way. If so you look Mike. for me, and I'll take you there if anyone wants to go to the bus. Um, so with that, that concludes this evening's event. And thank you again to everybody for coming. Appreciate it. Thank you.